Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Great to see you. We've saved the best for last. Uh, a panel on security, the security dimension in transatlantic <laughs> partnership, um, which is the third dimension we're going to talk about today. Um, we've just had a very interesting, as I found interesting, a, a debate on the political dimension, and we're trying not to have too much overlap with that. So we'd really like to uh, look at the security aspect which is very much, I think, embodied when we talk about transatlantic relationships in NATO. And uh, NATO is now entering its third phase of existence. It was founded in uh, the period of the Cold War and of bipolar confrontation. It then entered a period of pretty much American uh, economic and military predominance and uh, new wars and chaos and terrorism uh, in other parts of the world. And now we have a third era, I would like to argue, with emerging powers where that American dominance is being challenged and where that transatlantic alliance is being tested again. It is already the longest living military alliance that has ever existed. Um, so at the moment there seems to be the question on the European side of the Atlantic Ocean, um, how long can we still have it? And on the American side, there seems to be increasingly the question, do we still need it? That's at least what you understand from the rhetoric of the Trump administration, who has questioned um, the collective defense principle of NATO at various occasions. But there have also been practical things that we should look at. Um, Jamie Fly just said there he thinks there's no rupture across the Atlantic. But at least there have been some cracks for example, the United States pulling out of the INF Treaty, putting out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and the JPCOA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement. So all those things didn't actually uh, make transatlantic relationships and security better. So a question, and that is the key question that I would like to put forward for this debate, and that I would like to throw at our panelists, um, in how far can we still rely on that transatlantic link when it comes to defense and security for Europe. And I have uh, three people here who are brilliantly positioned um, to discuss that question. To my right is Nadia Kovacikova. She's based in Brussels. She works for the German Marshall Fund as a program manager and fellow. She's uh, specialized, among other topics, on NATO, on transatlantic relationships, and most specifically on hybrid warfare and disinformation. And uh, Nadia, of course, you do represent one organization that is really famous for being a champion of the transatlantic partnership. Um, so thanks for being here today. Um, then we have uh, Tina Tin Kida Shelley, who uh, was the first female defense minister of her country of origin, Georgia. She's now uh, the head of um, a think tank um, NGO. Uh, which is called Civic Idea. She's still very active in countering disinformation, in countering Russian influence in Georgia. Um, and as you said yesterday at dinner, you represent a country which called itself the balcony of Europe, which called itself part of Europe, but which is still looking for the recognition and integration that it would like to have. So an outsider looking to be an insider. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to welcome Vladimir Sokor. He is a senior fellow of the Jamestown Foundation in Washington. He's based in Munich, though. He's very much specialized on the region of Central and Eastern Europe. He has worked for decades on defense and security issues. And as you said yesterday, uh, being an American citizen, uh, having grown up in uh, Romania and being based in Munich, you have all three halves of NATO uh, in your own biography. Thanks for being here, Vladimir. 
So um, let's get into this debate and uh, let's start with you, Nadia. Um, what is your view on transatlantic partnership in defense at the moment and what should Europe do in your opinion? Well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Sebastian, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, so many experts uh, on economy and security and all the topics we have discussed already. So I hope we will be able to bring uh, also some new, fresh ideas into the debate. So the question is the role uh, of the US and the transatlantic bond uh, today. Can we still rely on this transatlantic bond? Well, from my perspective, coming from the Alliance for Secure and Democracy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, we are looking at we are looking at it from bipartisan perspective. Uh, uh, developing strategies to counter authoritarian interference in democracies. And the way we look at it, it's a transatlantic way. And we see that we cannot do it without each other. And what is the alternative? Is it better? We don't see a better alternative than stronger, enhanced transatlantic partnership on countering the hybrid threats today and of the future as well. Because the alternatives are, are not as strong and would make us weaker and the vulnerabilities that we face are common and the challenges are common. So therefore the solutions and the responses should be also common uh, and not excluding also other allies that we could uh, involve in this space, uh, including from Latin America or other democracies beyond the EU within Europe and elsewhere, Australia, New Zealand. So. Can we still rely on it? Yes, we can, because we don't have another option that is better option at the moment. We are also in common alliances such as NATO. 22 EU member states are part of NATO, and NATO has just celebrated the 70th anniversary, which has proved that there has been no war since the establishment of NATO on the European territory, which is a huge success. Uh, and we cannot take it for granted. We cannot take this freedom and democracy and the security that we have maintained during this time for granted. Because even here in Central Europe, in Czech Republic, I come from Slovakia uh, and in other countries. I just came from Georgia, from Tbilisi. The, the freedom and the security is something we should definitely protect. And uh, we have it. So we have it also thanks to the United States, thanks to this cooperation, and uh, I think we should continue making sure that we cooperate and coordinate our efforts. Um, maybe my last point is that we also have to build resilience, because there are threats that we are not aware of yet. We live in the digitized world, we, uh, we are facing new actors, state or non-state actors, um, new challenges such as cyber attacks, such as uh, further malign finance, uh, economic coercion, investments uh, that are, are not coordinated uh, within the EU, although there are some efforts and I'm sure we will come closer to that and discuss further. Uh, but I do think that building this resilience also against the new threats that we are not aware of at the moment, but we can kind of uh, expect focusing on artificial intelligence or using the blockchain or developing the technology thinking of how we can engage the public-private partnership, uh, how we can uh, engage the uh, startups, the, the NGOs, the civil society, the people, the media, all has been mentioned as well as very important actors. And uh, at the ASD, at the German Marshall Fund, we look at it in this holistic way. We see that these actors, and I speak mostly in the transatlantic uh, space, so the EU, NATO, national governments, media, civil society, but also the private sector are all five sectors that do have to, or actors, that they do have to cooperate much better, much more closely, much more systematically, and with strategic vision. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. We will come, come back to, to that in a minute. Um, I would now like to pass the question on to, to Tina team, and from your perspective, from Georgia, um, you've been promised to become a member of NATO at some point at the famous Bucharest summit in 2008. We all know that this is very improbable to happen anytime soon with parts of Georgia being occupied. Um, but how do you look at the development of European and transatlantic defense and security initiatives? What development would you wish for and what's the future of the transatlantic partnership in your view? Um. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers for having this very interesting conference and having us here. Um, well, the, um, I won't disagree with you, but um, we are not going to see it in the near future. Hopefully that future is pretty, is going to come pretty soon. 
Uh, although you are absolutely right, unfortunately, that uh, we do not see it, and it's very difficult to predict actually and exactly what's going to happen. But as for the um, transatlantic partnership, looking from the perspective of countries like Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, those um, in the backyard of the European Union trying to get into the European Union, trying to get to NATO to find their own way to democracy and uh, better future, secure future. Uh, there is no alternative, as it was already said. We do not see any other chance, any other prosperity, any other prospects for the world than yet bigger, stronger uh, ties uh, across the Atlantic uh, between the two. The um, question we usually ask uh, back home is, uh, the, and the question we struggle with is, who is in charge of the world today? Uh, is it NATO? Is it the United States? Is it the European Union? Or it's uh, Mr. Putin or China or uh, the uh, picture we saw just two days ago from the summit uh, amongst uh, uh, Russian, Iranian and uh, you know, Turkish leaders. The, the picture itself and the talk uh, we could have imagined behind the doors uh, amongst those three uh, well, scared me definitely, but I don't think I'm the only one in this world who was scared from um, thinking about what could have been uh, talked during uh, those meetings uh, and meetings like that that are happening around the world all the time. So if we answer this question, who is in charge of the world today, and be honest, uh, the next question comes is who is setting the agenda and unfortunately as we see it and we might be perfectly wrong and I'll be happy to be wrong but as we see it, it is not the democracies, these are not the countries who um, are in either in NATO or the European Union across the Atlantic but these are more those leaders uh, obviously including uh, Mr. Vladimir Putin and his friends uh, all around the world having the similar vision of the world, similar, similar vision of the new world order, new world civilization that they want to create and they want to offer to the rest of us. So because of that, because of that challenge, regardless of the fact Georgia is in or out or somewhere around and uh, uh, being under the partnership guidelines, whatever this partnership might mean at different times, it is in the um, interest of all of us, um, again, especially those in the neighborhood, to see uh, much stronger uh, transatlantic cooperation and much stronger voice uh, coming out of that cooperation uh, about or for supporting, defending, fighting for freedom and, uh, 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 and keeping the world order as we know it uh, after the Second World War in order to avoid even more complications in countries that uh, Russia or anyone else considers as their backyard and their own neighborhood they need to be in charge of. Um, so I, um, I, I'm a strong believer of uh, no one man being able to destroy something that was built over 70 years and I hope that uh, President Trump is not going to be the one and uh, I believe that uh, we are, regardless of Brexit, regardless of all those cracks that you mentioned that we are all witnessing today, um, this cooperation will be there and then we found the formula which will help it to, to survive for even longer than as it looks like right now. Thank you very much. Uh, Tina Team, um, you agreed with a lot that Nadia also said. Um, you also said there is no alternative to it, we should keep it. Um, I would like to challenge that in, in a minute, but let's first hear from Vladimir, um, who has followed developments in the Transatlantic Partnership longer than we have done. So we're looking forward to your statement. The uh, Donald Trump administration is deeply committed to the security and defense of Europe. This administration has reversed the, the benign neglect of Europe of the second term of the Bush administration and the malign neglect of European defense during both terms of the Obama administration. This administration has reversed that. It has massively invested for the first time in many years in the defense and deterrence on NATO's Eastern Front. NATO is an organization for the defense of Europe. It is not a counterinsurgency organization, not an anti-terrorist organization, not a peacekeeping organization. It 
is an organization structured for military defense, which has long been neglected until two years ago. The only th military threat to, to, to Europe at present is Russia. The military threat is associated with a wide range of other threats, collectively known as hybrid threats. The location in Europe, the primary location in Europe of those threats is the region from the Baltic to the Black Sea, NATO's Eastern Front. I don't use the term flank, I use the term front, because we are facing a threat in front of us on the Eastern Front. The region from the Baltic to the Black Sea is the new center of gravity of NATO. In terms of threats, in terms of local awareness of those threats, the Eastern Front is the new center of gravity. It is also the new center of gravity of American national commitments channeled via NATO, but also outside NATO's framework to defend those countries. The Baltic States, Poland, Romania in the first place, those countries rely on their bilateral commitments from the United States rather than on the collective NATO to respond in a crisis. The American troop deployments in Europe are anachronistic. They are not located where the threats are. They are located far away from the threats. It is a legacy of the Cold War. That's where the American bases were located. And they were developed during many years to the top American standards of quality. Which is why it is difficult to relocate them to the East. And moreover, during the post-Cold War period, American bases in Europe were used as a platform for power projection of the United States into the greater Middle East in the context of expeditionary wars, which detracted from NATO's military preparedness and distracted NATO politically. That is why the Trump administration is doing a catch-up race to recover the lost time and the lost ground. <laughs> this puts not only NATO, but also the European Union in front of the following challenge. The challenge of ensuring, or rather guaranteeing, American military mobility inside Europe. In the event of a crisis on the Eastern Front, American forces would have to come from far away. They would have to cross Europe to respond to a crisis on the Eastern Front. Most likely, members, some members of NATO would not participate, would not be able to participate. They lack the resources, they lack the mobility. What the American troops would need in this situation is high mobility on European, which means primarily German, highways and railways for American heavy equipment. German highways and railways at the present time do not correspond with those requirements. They need significant upgrades. Europeans lack airlift. The United States has airlift and can airlift troops. But the heavy equipment would have to come through German ports and German highways and railways. And, this, and, and if Germany is unwilling to support its Bundeswehr to the, requ to the required level, which is not the case, Germany could at least allocate resources for development of dual purpose highways and railways that could also be used for civilian purposes, but would be there to be used for military purposes in the event of a crisis on the Eastern Front. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Vladimir. And I would like to follow up directly on that, talking about deployment of uh, troops. Um, since you live in Munich, you will have heard that the uh, U.S. ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, said if Germany doesn't pay, pay its fair share, we might consider moving our troops that are deployed in Germany to Poland or somewhere else. Um, how do you look at that statement uh, against the background of what you just said? Is that just the announcement of something that makes a lot of sense? Is it something that should really uh, ex exercise pressure on Germany? Or is it even something that de destabilizes NATO because it uh, makes to everyone else visible that there is the, the trust, the mutual trust, or that the NATO countries are fighting with you, with you have on that? How do you look at that? Uh, there, are, there are several views, at least two views, uh, in Washington about this. One view would be to count German investment into highways and railways as part of Germany's 2% commitment. According to this view, not all of the 2% would have to be uh, spent strictly for the Bundeswehr, but part of it could be spent to upgrade uh, overland communications and port reception facilities in Germany. Count that towards the 2%. Another view, as Ambassador Grenell uh, mentioned, would be indeed to relocate a larger number of troops from Germany to Poland. This is mainly a civilian view in Washington. The military have objections because the military uh, have uh, become accustomed to the highly developed base structure in Germany primarily, but also to some extent in Italy and to some extent in Spain. That main structure is there, does not have to be, uh, uh, does not require more capital investments. And it is ideally developed to American standards, whereas this would have to be started from scratch in Poland. The American presence in uh, Poland uh, is not a tripwire presence, it is a war fighting presence. But it is not enough, it is below the level that would provide convincing deterrence and defense. NATO's uh, presence in the Baltic states is tripwire and not credible. It is not considered credible. It is, uh, NATO has no, uh, no known plans about how to respond to a Russian incursion into the uh, Baltic states at least in the publicly available literature. Uh, I don't know and we don't know what NATO troop contingents would do in, a, in the Baltic states. They are there for tripwire, not for, not for war fighting. Would they simply hunker down? Would the Russians simply bypass them? They are battalion size, very small. Would the Russians uh, simply bypass them? Would they be uh, evacuated or would the Russians provide an evacuation corridor for them in the crisis? Or would they fight uh, at heavy loss of life? We don't know. And NATO has no public planning for that. Any NATO response in a crisis on the Eastern Front would have to be politically authorized by the North Atlantic Council. By the way, I noticed that General Pavel is in the audience. I'm sure he might want to contribute to this discussion. Uh, so the North Atlantic Council would have to respond in a crisis. And there are questions about whether the North Atlantic Council might not slow down an American response by raising questions, which may be legitimate questions, about who is really involved in an aggression, who is really responsible, how did, how, how did we come to that. And the decisions in, in the North Atlantic Council have to be taken unanimously. So these are the dilemmas that we now face. Right, uh, thank you, uh, Vladimir. Um, I have a follow-up question for Nadia and for Tina Tien, and then I'd like to throw it open to you. Uh, you've honored us by staying until the end of conference. Uh, we would like to honor that by giving you ample opportunity to ask your questions. Um, Nadia, you said that, um, or you stressed how important it is that uh, the United States and Europe stand together um, in the face of new challenges. Um, 
The United States are claiming uh, repeatedly, and this is not only the Trump administration, that Europe doesn't pay its fair share. We just uh, had that already. Um, if we now look at the new European Commission and the way it's being built, its priorities, um, then uh, we find that, well, this commission is being headed by a former Minister of Defense, which maybe already raises some expectations, um, and we find a new uh, DG, a new General Directorate, which compares a bit to a ministry on a national level, which is called Defense Industry and Space. Um, what message does the establishment of such a DG send to our American partners, Nadia? Well, knowing from the documents, the joint declarations between NATO and EU, uh, the second one especially already uh, last year, I don't think US is surprised that Europe is trying to develop more of the defense capabilities. And um, actually NATO and the US within NATO are supportive of the of the US uh, defense as far as it's not going to duplicate the efforts or the tools that are already existing. Uh, another way we could look at it is that EU is investing or wants to invest even more under the new commissioner, the French commissioner uh, of the internal market into the European Defence Fund, into the European Defence Budget, the PESCO, uh, the defence uh, initiatives uh, and capabilities and innovation, which could also mean the enhancement of the strategic autonomy conversation and could also mean that we are uh, deterring the focus from or you know distracting from the cooperation with the United States because we want to become more autonomous, we want to become more independent. But I do not think that it's in the European interest to in any case uh, get away from the support of the US and the cooperation from the US and that it wants to be independent because it does not have the army, it does not have the common security and defense policy uh, to the extent that it would be able to probably defend itself if, uh, if a war developed. As also Mr. Sokor mentioned, uh, we, we wonder what would be the reaction. I am I'm sure, I mean, we, can, we have to trust that within the NATO, and if you're a NATO ally and Article 5 is evoked, it, it will protect, it will defend the member states. But the investing into technology and defense and maybe exploring other uh, spaces or the space itself uh, can also contribute to the overall, um, to the overall potential of uh, the transatlantic defense. All right, um, thank you. I was thinking that if, when Donald Trump came to Brussels for the NATO summit 2018, was among other messages basically saying please buy American arms. So by establishing a, a DG which focuses so much on the defense industry, it could very well also be understood from, on the American side as a response that says no, we will produce our own arms. And do you think that that might cause um, a, more discussions in the future? I think we will have a lot of discussions in the future, especially uh, we will see what happens after 2020 elections in the United States and um, uh, who will be uh, leading the country afterwards. Uh, but I think it's what I see and what I uh, analyze and what I know is that the interest is to cooperate. Uh, we have the commitment that the member states of the EU will comply with the 2% of the GDP by 2024. Uh, we had also heard, we heard this morning, also here the Czech Republic is going to abide by the Prime Minister himself, expressed himself clearly, it's uh, his commitment. Uh, so I, I do have a trust that even though if there are further discussions, and there should be, we should, we should question the, the relationship and we should, but in the positive way, in a constructive way, that we are not going to just take it as it is without also looking at the vulnerabilities that remain that we have. We have to be critical because we are partners and if you want to advance and we want to be able to face the challenges that are coming, we also have to make sure that we are, uh, we are thinking of the scenarios, the crisis management scenarios, the, the cooperation, that we are investing into the right things, that we are prioritizing in the right way. And I do think that the discussions uh, will happen, but I do not think they will be necessarily uh, negative. All right, then my final question before we throw it open to Tina Tien. Um, I said I would like to challenge uh, your uh, assessment that there is no alternative to the transit partnership. Some would say there is. It's called 
a European army. Um, we might not have it tomorrow, but we might have it at some point. Um, why don't you consider that an alternative? Well, yeah, there is always alternative. There is another one it's called Eurasian Union and its collective security instrument uh, led by Russia. And then we can also consider other alternatives uh, led by China or Iran or I don't know. Uh, very, the different variations. What I mean when I say there is no alternative, it's like a democracy, you know, in this famous phrase that uh, it's not ideal but uh, nothing better has been invented yet. Uh, that's kind of a uh, similar concept with the transatlantic cooperation. Yeah, it might not be ideal and there might be lots of problems and if we talk honestly, we, we can come up with a list of the problems, uh, why it should not exist as it is today. But at the same time, uh, in this world of uh, rising powers from all sorts of different directions, um, challenging democracy, challenging freedom, challenging current uh, world order, uh, I brings us to the fact that there is no alternative today as we see it. European army, always a possibility. With Brexit, this possibility is uh, looks even less uh, possible than with, with the UK on uh, in the European Union. I think that uh, uh, especially on the security uh, front, European Union, uh, security and defense front, European Union is losing a lot uh, with the UK leaving the European Union. But yeah, in the future, sometimes, of course, why not? But uh, again, uh, excluding the United States, not relying on the United States anymore, today does not really look like a possibility looking at what is happening in various European Union countries and knowing how much attention and resources they are devoting to defense and security currently does not really bring us to the optimism that there is a future for that. But I just very briefly I want to comment on Eastern Front and uh, the um, um, NATO uh, in Baltics uh, and the seriousness of this whole operation issue as someone who is deeply uh, interested and who has kind of a, uh, my country's uh, uh, widened interest in this whole Eastern Front Russia deterrence uh, actions by the NATO. Um, well, there are several dimensions to it. I completely agree with the um, actual uh, uh, fighting capability and actual uh, oppos opposition capability of those troops being deployed in the Baltic states uh, if there is a Russian invasion tomorrow. And uh, I don't think that there is anyone in this audience who has a different opinion that they themselves will not be able to defend and protect and guarantee the security of the Baltic countries, but we all want to see, at least want to see it, and we want to believe that this whole operation was more of a deterrence power rather than actual fighting power. It was more of a political decision on the side of Brussels uh, and NATO, so telling to Russia particularly that they are serious about those threats, they see those threats, and they are ready to to be there uh, whenever it will be necessary and uh, important. The uh, importance, more important is, it's not the size of those troops in Baltic states, but more important is how serious is NATO about the Article 5, and how seriously the, the member states are ready to go and fight in Nagwa or in other parts of uh, uh, Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania if something happens. Uh, and whether every other country in NATO, including Macedon Northern Macedonia tomorrow, are ready to commit themselves to this cause. Uh, but uh, the other aspect or other dimension of this uh, whole policy is how seriously Moscow takes it. How seriously Moscow takes that NATO is ready to evoke Article 5 if there will be need for that. And I think we have a serious problem on that because of all the political um, uh, discussions and political statements and political um, uh, hysteria, I would even say, that is going on uh, and coming out of the leaders of NATO member states as to the seriousness of invoking Article 5 if something happens. Uh, what will definitely make sure that Moscow believes that NATO is serious about it is NATO taking up on a serious challenge coming from uh, Moscow and addressing that challenge and basically telling to Moscow that uh, they are not the ones who are setting up the rules or dictating the rules or telling them what to do, how to do, when to be, uh, when and where, how to behave. 
Again, Sebastian mentioned in the beginning, oh, it's been already more than 10 years that Georgia was promised NATO membership. It's been 10 years that we are working with various platforms, plans, agendas, um, lots of different um, uh, uh, benchmark sets for Georgia. We go after each of those and we fulfill each of those. And every other NATO summit since Bucharest says that we have reached the mark that was put by NATO for Georgia. And then there is yet another mark. And then uh, after two years on another NATO summit, we are so oh, thank you, and you are great guys. Uh, you, you've reached this mark as well. And uh, regardless of that, Yes, it is unfortunately true that we have no idea if the membership is uh, even in the plans. And even more, when I was Minister of Defense, in some capitals of NATO member countries, I had a feeling, very strong feeling actually, that uh, those leaders were regretting that they've ever made a promise to Georgia rather than thinking about how to fulfill the promise that they made to Georgia 10 years ago. Uh, as long as this policy stays like that, as long as the reason why Georgia is denied membership, or Ukraine for that matter, or any other country is firing the membership, is that Russia created a problem, Russia is developing on that problem, Russia is gaining from that problem, and then Brussels is saying, well, yeah, guys, you are great, but sorry, because Russia created a problem, we cannot have you in. Then we are dealing with that elephant in the room that nobody wants to mention. They are the ones who are making decisions for NATO. The only response when Kremlin will start to believe that NATO is serious about its own decision making, and NATO is serious about its own um, uh, obligations or its own promises made, is if they start keeping those promises and actually realizing and making steps for fulfilling those promises. Otherwise, we can agree that NATO itself is serious about Article 5, but as long as Mr. Putin does not believe that NATO is serious about Article 5, then we cannot promise to each other that there will be no new war in this continent um, uh, again, sometimes, hopefully not soon, but sometimes in our lifetime. Thank you. Seeing as a call of consequence, um, and as you also suggest, um, European a European army doesn't necessarily contradict transatlantic partnership. Um, I would now open the floor to you. Uh, just three basic rules. Please stand up and state briefly who you are. Um, please uh, let us know to whom your question is directed. And uh, with a view to the time, please keep it brief. Um, are there any questions uh, in the plenary? Yes, please. We have a microphone here for you. Thank you. My name is Kees Klomperauer, I'm the ambassador of the Netherlands here in Prague, previously ambassador in Ukraine. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Soko for his remarks, and I can testify to the fact that he mentioned that a lot has been done by the U.S. administration uh, to strengthen NATO, but also to strengthen the neighborhood, and to lessen, let's say, the opportunity for those of abusing the weak situation of certain neighborhood countries. So, that is certainly a fact. So. We should take those uh, into account. And uh, it's true, uh, NATO has taken a number of decisions, uh, such as the Readiness Initiative and the initiatives on military mobility that are important and need to be implemented. Our European Union is going to contribute to the costs of military mobility. So here we already have an area where some overlap of interest is possible. Now my question. My question um, it's a bit of a daring question, but we have here experts of high quality. Um, um, it's about Brexit. Uh, it is generally assumed that Brexit will not affect NATO. Is that really the case? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone specifically who you would like to respond to that one? Is there one speaker that you would uh, prefer to respond to that? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, all right. Do we have, we collect a second question, we won't forget yours, and then we will come to you. Please. The gentleman here with the tie. Thank you. My name is Andrzej Olczanski from Severo Institute. I'm a security analyst. I would like to follow up on the question of uh, NATO enlargement, because what really presses the three countries that has been promised uh, NATO membership on the Bucharest summit is that 
whatever precious metal uh, membership or promise, the only thing that uh, really matters for these countries is the notion of collective security and the notion that the NATO members, such standing, will not forget them when the when the opportunity for defense rises. So, I would like to ask you if this is the time for NATO to reconsider the admission priorities and their admission criteria, such as uh, that the state has to com completely control its territory. Because this notion provides Russia with opportunity to block any further, any possible future NATO membership for a country when the Russia has opportunity to simply create and non-governmental controlled exclave. So this is my question, is it time for NATO to reconsider its admission preferences and criteria? Thank you. All right, thank you. We will uh, have a second round uh, soon. Maybe we can also, if you don't mind, I see that uh, Mr. Pedro Babel is in the audience, who is former uh, chairman of the NATO Military Committee. Maybe, if you don't mind, you, we can have your response to that question uh, also. Uh, but let's start with Brexit. Whenever we talk about Brexit, I think it's fun to have a little poll. Hands up, who in this room thinks that Brexit will ever happen? British do, <laughs> but it's a minority that thinks so. All right, thank you. The rest, I assume, doesn't think so. Um, <laughs> the rest is confused by Brexit. Um, Nadia, may I uh, throw that question to you? Um, will Brexit really not affect NATO? Um. I think it might affect in some areas. It might even affect positively in a way because UK is now looking for their priorities, how they can uh, project their importance in the world, economic world, security environment. And I think NATO for them is a natural space, natural platform where they can engage potentially even more and enhance their role within NATO. Um, when it comes to the NATO-EU cooperation, I wonder if there will be some impact, but because the NATO-EU cooperation is still, a, I would say, in the more stuff to stuff talk and a lot of to uh, develop on that front, maybe the impact will not be that high. UK has very strong army. They have a lot of uh, defense capabilities, and as, um, as we heard earlier, uh, it's a loss for the EU, but for NATO, it also means that uh, they are keeping the UK, they have the expertise also on sanctions, so when it comes to um, maybe cooperation with the EU, the expertise of UK and the, and the sanctions policy as a very effective foreign policy tool can also contribute potentially to engage the, the EU partners that are losing potentially this expertise in a, in a way that uh, is not institutionalized anymore. Um, but I do think that if there is a positive effect on NATO um, with Brexit, it's hard to say because Brexit is a sad, it's a sad affair and it might not even happen, as you mentioned. Uh, and also longer it takes, there is a kind of a um, kind of impression or the feeling between the member states of EU or NATO that might discourage uh, uh, some, uh, some initiatives or uh, make them um, uh, postponed. So, I would say if there is an impact on NATO, it might be rather a stronger engagement of UK within NATO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, interesting point. You might also think that uh, if Brexit damages the GDPs of both sides, 2% of less will also be less, maybe? I, I was thinking of the connection that the French investment made between trade and security. These two, two domains are getting more connected. I was thinking of the connection that the French ambassador just made in a panel before. Um, the fact that trade and security get more and more connected. And you connect the economy also to the defense 
uh, expenditures. So there is a connection between security and economy. Uh, so um, uh, my estimation uh, would be that the effect would be negative because uh, all sorts of issues uh, that are now contained in one domain might, you know, infect the other and make management of the issues more complicated. Good. Um, thank you very much. Um, Tina, Tina um, would you agree with the gentleman at the back? Um, should NATO now reconsider its principles? Um, well, yes and no. It depends uh, what we mean by those principles. Nobody uh, uh, says that the countries cannot make themselves the uh, reservations to uh, such a level, uh, being it uh, territories or being it uh, uh, certain articles of the uh, Washington uh, Treaty. Uh, there is a suggestion on the table um, uh, made by uh, lots of different uh, experts and uh, uh, people working in security fields all around the world uh, about Georgia to NATO and it does not necessarily need any changes of the NATO uh, documents, principles, uh, regulations themselves. It's just about the political will on the side of NATO member states to have Georgia on board and then Georgia uh, uh, as a matter of suggestion of membership, basically um, making it clear that uh, we are ready to enter NATO without Article 5 being uh, evoked in our occupied territories. Uh, and again, you don't need to change anything in NATO documents because it's legally very much possible right now. Today we can do it if there is a political will and political agreement on the side of NATO to do that. So that's why I say yes and no if somebody feels that there is a need for that to be reflected in NATO documents. That's fine, but again, legally speaking, there is no need for that. It's not the, unfortunately, it's not the lawyer's world. It's more of a political, um, lacking the political courage world today to make bold moves on the side of NATO member states um, in terms of uh, making, uh, again, bold and strong statements towards Russia. I think that Tbilisi will be ready for any kind of solution that goes in line with this um, principle if there is a readiness on the side of NATO to work through, uh, through uh, those suggested arguments. But unfortunately it's not there, so it's very difficult to, to see whether uh, occupation is used just as an argument uh, for something that uh, is politically there, that they just don't want expansion in the former Soviet or uh, Russia's claimed neighborhood territories, or there is a real reason of the occupation. If the second is the case, then we can always talk about it and find a solution, but you don't really see it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, the question of uh, Georgia's and Ukraine's possible accession to NATO. What we have in NATO since 2008 is a political process and it is clearly deadlocked. It will remain deadlocked for the foreseeable future because most of the Western European countries do not want to admit Ukraine and Georgia as members of NATO, most of them. A few of them do. Notably, Turkey favors Georgia's accession to NATO. Turkey. But most of the West Europeans don't, both regarding Georgia and regards Ukraine. So the political process is deadlocked, will remain deadlocked for a long time. In parallel to this, there is a military process, carried on mostly by the United States, practically exclusively by the United States in Georgia. NATO collectively has done very little in Georgia. Basically, it built a training center. At Vazia. Not a top of the line training center. Non lethal, of course, it's not a lethal capability. In the meantime, there is the Georgia Readiness Defense Program, run by the United States with the Georgian Army, a bilateral program. And the United States is leading military exercises in Georgia every year. And in the last few years, the United States has started bringing heavy equipment 
Abrams tanks, uh, Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. Testing, by the way, military mobility. The United States is bringing these vehicles from Europe, from Western Europe, via Romania, Bulgaria, the Black Sea into Georgia. Testing all the time military mobility. So the United States is bearing the brunt alone in Georgia. The, these uh, annual exercises being held in Georgia are called multinational exercises. They are not called NATO exercises because Germany is the first place and some other countries don't want to call them NATO exercises. That would be too much of encouragement to Georgia, too much of a provocation with Russia, for Russia, as they think. So they are multinational exercises with minimal French or German participation or none. In Ukraine, meanwhile, there is an informal coalition of the willing to assist the Ukrainian army militarily, including with lethal equipment. The United States bears the brunt again, almost alone, but with some help from Canada, Britain, and Lithuania. Little help, but valuable help. It's an informal coalition of the willing. So the military process is, oh, by the way, the military exercises in Ukraine are also called multinational not NATO. Germany and uh, France are absent, or almost absent. So the military process is running in parallel process. It is American-led, a little via NATO, mostly outside NATO, while the deadlocked political process is being run by NATO. This is a reality today. It will remain so for the foreseeable future. And incidentally, it confronts the Georgian and Ukrainian governments with a difficult problem of, manage, of expectation management at the level of public opinion. So public opinion expects the governments to deliver NATO membership. So the governments have to go to all kinds of uh, rhetorical acrobatics to management to manage these expectations. Thank you. Uh, just right. half word because it's not. Uh, it is absolutely right about the political party. They won't say anything about it. Unfortunately, there is a political deadlock. As for the military, it's not absolutely correct. We have two parallel big trainings in Georgia. One, as it was mentioned, led by Americans. Um, uh, it's called Noble Partnership, uh, and it's 100% uh, actually. Well, okay, 90%. Uh, Americans uh, plus some um, British and then uh, year by year the third partner varies. When I was minister, for example, we have Poles intensively now, there were um, uh, others also involved this year, for example. But we have in every July, every year, another training, it's called Agile Spirit, and it is called NATO trainings in Georgia. Uh, for five years now in a row, I started it as a minister. I demanded to be, it to be called as NATO trainings, and they are officially called as NATO annual uh, trainings. And every year it increases in size. And this year, for example, it was the largest ever. We had 18 countries participate, 18 NATO member countries participating. As for Germans and French, we have a always very active German participation. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same about the France, but uh, Germans are always there. Uh, in every training, in every activity, we, there is nothing we can complain. Militarily, speak military assistance while speaking about Germans. Political is a different story. Saves the honor of uh, NATO and... No, no, European I mean, it's a, it's a fact. I cannot... It yes. will be very dishonest of me to do that. I would like to, um, if you don't mind, I would like to give you uh, the opportunity, uh, General Pavel, to maybe briefly comment specifically on this or generally on what you've heard from the speakers before we have another round of questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would use the opportunity of organizing the uh, uh, It takes a second after you start. So, uh, because it was specifically mentioned by Mr. Sokol, what, what is the potential situation of NATO forces in Baltic countries in, in, if attacked? So we know that you are already retired from your position, so perhaps you could be a little bit revealing about these issues. I remember that this, he said that they would be easily passed by and the question is of the evacuation. It could be a little bit, it sounds a little bit scary for a lot of people, so perhaps you could put some clarity into it. So, 
Okay, thank you for the opportunity and let me first uh, thank uh, Tina Tin for uh, somehow defending NATO despite uh, not so good behavior of NATO towards Georgia. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, there is much more uh, of uh, NATO presence uh, uh, beyond the United States, both in uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine. And uh, to be quite frank, uh, when uh, we discussed uh, with uh, the partners uh, possible extension of uh, uh, our support and training missions, we could hardly find something uh, where uh, they, uh, there would be still uh, a capacity to absorb. So uh, we had to uh, keep it uh, within the, the limits to allow for uh, smooth absorption of uh, the training and support provided. Uh, there is also uh, plenty of training uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Poles, Baltic countries, Canadians, Brits, many others. So I think uh, it would be quite unfair to say that it's uh, exclusively U.S. business and uh, NATO is doing nothing in uh, these uh, two partner, partner countries. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the uh, political process uh, uh, of accession because it's um, beyond uh, my responsibilities uh, as a former chairman. But uh, uh, in military terms, uh, I have to say that uh, both countries are making great uh, progress and uh, they, uh, they could be easily easily uh, admitted uh, in military terms uh, today because uh, uh, they meet uh, the same criteria as uh, many other smaller uh, NATO members today. So it's uh, clearly uh, a political issue. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, forward uh, presence, what Vladimir calls a frontal area, I will stick uh, stick uh, to uh, to flank because uh, I don't want to uh, uh, suggest that uh, we are somehow uh, uh, on a front line with with Russia. It would probably go go too far. Uh, I uh, fully uh, fully accept uh, uh, the concerns that uh, all the nations on uh, uh, that eastern flank of the alliance uh, had after uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia, uh, but. Uh, uh, we also have to see uh, all the efforts uh, leading to uh, first uh, admission of uh, assurance measures and then, uh, then uh, uh, reinforcement of presence, uh, which resulted uh, in what was called enhanced forward presence. And you are right, it is not, uh, not uh, uh, military uh, deterrence, because uh, it was not conceived as a purely military deterrence. It was uh, military uh, in nature, but uh, more, uh, much more political deterrence. Uh, that's why uh, there was a lot of efforts uh, in having a broad spectrum of uh, NATO flags, including major NATO countries, uh, to uh, uh, clearly uh, demonstrate uh, the willingness and determination uh, to be part of uh, defense of uh, this region uh, uh, in case of uh, a crisis. So uh, we have uh, we have uh, um, Canada, we have. Uh, UK, uh, we have uh, United States, we have Germany, uh, so all these countries are, are there, plus many many others. Uh, to uh, make it uh, right, uh, uh, your statement about uh, uh, absence of plans, I have, uh, I have to say, uh, obviously military plans are not open open documents for public consumption. Uh, there are plans uh, for a number of regions. Uh, those plans uh, were uh, developed uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Uh, uh, they were called uh, graduated readiness plans. Uh, they are very detailed. Uh, they were uh, worked out uh, uh, in uh, uh, coordination uh, with uh, uh, the nations concerned. They were uh, even uh, coordinated with uh, the partners, uh, uh, including uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, because uh, they uh, would be affected in, uh, in, in case of, of a crisis in the region. And of course, uh, now uh, the, uh, the, uh, this uh, family of graduate um, readiness plans that uh, are uh, linked uh, to specific regions are uh, being uh, interlinked into uh, one comprehensive plan so that the uh, uh, commander uh, in uh, the area, would, which would normally be Saker, would have uh, full flexibility of uh, moving from one uh, plan to another uh, and uh, have a smooth transition of uh, forces. With regard uh, to uh, forward present, uh, presence troops, uh, they are definitely not considered as uh, training only entities. Uh, they are being sent to the area as potentially combat forces. 
So they uh, train together with uh, with uh, local uh, local forces, and they uh, have the mandate from their uh, sending countries to fight if necessary. So uh, there uh, are linkages between uh, uh, their presence uh, means uh, multinational presence within the these multinational battalions linked to national forces. On top of it, uh, VGTF, which uh, which is, uh, which is uh, very high in uh, 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 groupings at uh, a level of brigade. Then the whole NATO response force, and then obviously all the main main forces uh, of, of nations that uh, would be uh, uh, attached to uh, to uh, the missions and two different plans. Uh, so there is uh, the whole variety of uh, measures uh, uh, that uh, can be used uh, by uh, NATO on military military side uh, to uh, provide uh, full flexibility to react uh, to uh, any any uh, circumstance on uh, on uh, that uh, that flank. So. I would probably st uh, stay here with the statement that uh, it's not so bad. Thank you so much, uh, General, for contributing. Uh, I would like to throw it open one more time and have a series of, of questions. Um, Alexander was was first, um, and then we have Jan. Thank you. And again, Alexander Tsarchuk from Ukraine, East European Security Research Initiative Foundation, based in Kiev. I have one question, one small command, some kind of questions. First of all, about uh, NATO engagement in Ukraine. We have a comprehensive assistance package adopted for Ukraine, where we have uh, almost eight NATO trust funds, with almost all NATO member states involved. They all made uh, quite a good donations to Ukraine, and it's not simply a military issue related to the U.S. assistance to Ukraine. But nevertheless, U.S. assistance is still dominated. Another thing that we should think over is this, it's NATO public diplomacy. It's very useful for both Ukraine and Georgia as well, because we should combine our efforts on the level of civil society activities. If you couldn't find a common understanding uh, on track one issue, we could invent or promote further track two activities to push forward track one, just to find a common solution and to combine our efforts, not to act independently. Georgia strive for some kinds of NATO membership and Ukraine as well. We, we should combine our efforts and to do common things, especially um, in the very dangerous environments we have now in the Black Sea region. And other things, it's new NATO, um, NATO, uh, NATO enlargement strategies. We should also a little bit postpone or a little bit um, make a, a shift of NATO public diplomacy, not only to the Eastern European states, but to the NATO member states, to explain them why we should spend more money for this GDP increase or why we should rebuild our infrastructure just to make this NATO new, new policy possible for all of us. This is a new kind of NATO diplomacy to be used more actively and I, I think it will be very useful. I just uh, uh, want to do to some uh, reactions from uh, distinguished panelists about the possible kind of using all the things, how to combine our efforts, I mean Ukraine and Georgia, and how to use this public diplomacy. Combine both countries' efforts to, yeah. to join. Uh, thank yeah. you, Alexander. Yeah. Um, yeah, you were raising your hand. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question, it's um, uh, for Vladimir, but maybe all of you could uh, briefly touch on it. Uh, it's great that you came here that you are such a strong defender of Mr. Trump. It's not easy to find uh, defenders of Mr. Mr. Trump in Europe especially. but. Uh, I agree with you on uh, many issues, but uh, why do you think he said that NATO is obsolete first? Was it uh, like some smart like tactics, or, or did he want to provoke us in Europe, or wake, wake us up, or was it intention, or, or was he really thinking that it's obsolete? Or uh, so, uh, so what's your uh, opinion take on that? Thank you so much, uh, Jan. I'm also looking forward to that response. Um, and we have time for one final question, and that will be to you, uh, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's from Minister uh, It's In a way, it's your opinion, not so much about Georgia, but about Russia. Uh, first, on the issue of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, is it your impression that they are now being integrated increasingly especially after the Russian invasion, into Russia. In other words, that there is a decreasing prospect of Georgia ever recovering them because
which they have become essentially Russian satellites, even really part of the Russian state. Uh, uh, your, uh, your opinion on that. And secondly, on the case of Russia, there's been large demonstrations in Moscow and elsewhere. Quite a lot of people are now saying, Russia watchers are saying, that uh, opposition to President Putin is growing. So is also repression of these uh, demonstrations. But what, from the view of Russia, from from the view of Georgia, from your view, are you seeing? Do you think an increasing pressure upon the upon the, the, the Putin administration, and how would that affect Georgia? Perfect. Thanks for all three questions. I, as a distribution, I suggest um, Tina Tin responds to that question on Georgia. If uh, you, Vladimir, could respond on the question on the common approach of Georgia and Ukraine joining NATO, and if I may ask you, Nadia, to respond on uh, why Donald Trump might have those comments, um, if, if NATO uh, might be obsolete. Um, and I must ask you to be a bit brief because we are running out of time. Tina, may we start with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll be. Uh, uh, I'll be really brief. The no sample. Take this one. Um, I'll be really brief. As for the prospects of President Autosetia being reintegrated in Georgia and its time uh, uh, in Russia, I, I we need to differentiate. These are two different stories. Um, uh, Abkhazia is an entity that actually people there and uh, the um, political groups and movements and elites they are actually seeing and um, having a very clear idea of Abkhazia being an independent state. And South Ossetia, which is a completely different story, and you do not really have that kind of a vision or that kind of an idea uh, coming out of Trinwari. So they see themselves more as part of Russia rather than as an independent state. Because of this difference, there is obviously a completely different uh, policy towards Russia as well. Abkhaz are scared of Russians exactly the same way Abkhaz say not the people who live in Abkhazia, because they are in a huge minority there, in a very big minority in Abkhazia. But the idea that those who were, um, who started this whole movement of uh, Abkhazia separated from Georgia and being an independent state, I always say that they are the biggest allies actually of a Georgian state, because their opinion of Russia, Russia's desires, willingness, uh, political ambitions towards Abkhazia is exactly the same as ours. There is no difference between the two. The only difference we have between amongst each other is that they don't trust us and they don't believe that they have a future with Georgians because they see us as imperialists taking over exactly the same way as they see Russians. As long as that movement is strong in Abkhazia, uh, there is no prospect for Russia integrating and absorbing basically Abkhazia fully, uh, which automatically means that there is a chance for Georgia if we manage to escape from this vicious circle of um, democracy, revolution, and then getting into the authoritarianism, and then another revolution, and then again getting into the authoritarianism, getting cra crazy completely time after time, then, and if we have a chance of real uh, democracy built in Georgia with a more or less prosperity and social welfare, I think there is a chance for unification in some one way or another. I don't mean in one unitarian state, obviously, but in some format with Abkhaz. South Ossetia, as I said again, it's, uh, they, they do not see themselves as a state. They see themselves in Russia completely incorporated. That's the only way they see they can survive. But at the same time, we have an experience with South Ossetia when things cooled down and there was actually a prospect created for people-to-people -people cooperation. We basically solved the conflict in South Ossetia on a human, on a human level. There was no nothing in between us anymore before 2008 war. And actually this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why war happened in 2008, because we got too close to each other and there were no barriers and there was no war and conflict or blood or whatever between the two anymore. And Russia was quite scared of the prospects of all of it ending up um, in South Ossetia. Actually it was just a matter of one elections 
uh, in Trimali and the problem would have been solved and we were at that stage at that moment in for three years from 2005 up to the war the situation was extremely stable and extremely friendly uh, so I do uh, if I have a very simple formula and I finish with this on that if Georgians will be if there will be a moment when Georgians will agree that they want to live in their own country we have a chance of Abkhaz and Ossetia is also starting to think to live in, in that country. Unfortunately, we are not there. Unfortunately, big majority of Georgians, Georgians are thinking about leaving the country and finding their own way somewhere else because they do not see future, they do not see development, they do not see prosperity and prospect for themselves or their kids. In Georgia, we just had polls released yesterday by NDI, like the very recent, yesterday and today actually, they released two different parts. And this is at the highest of all times, like all 18 years that NDI is doing polls in Georgia, which shows that there is a political depression in the country. People completely lost all the hope and all the all belief that something good might happen to them. Okay. And obviously under those circumstances it's very difficult to convince Abkhaz to, to come back. Thanks for your assessment, uh, Tina Tsi. Um, Vladimir, um, in a few words, um, is there a way that Georgia and Ukraine could combine their efforts to become a NATO member? Uh, NATO traditionally has uh, accepted new countries as members in packages. So I suppose the question uh, that we got refers to that experience. Countries were accepted in packages, in several rounds of enlargement. That was good for NATO from a public relations uh, point of view. But there is no majority in... Of course, admission to NATO has to be accepted, uni approved unanimously. At the present time, I suppose the majority of NATO countries are against admitting NATO and Georgia. All the military assessment that I hear from professional military is that Georgia and Ukraine are ready to join NATO from the point of view of military preparedness. But NATO is not ready uh, politically. Uh, the, the, there is a question of the, of the unresolved uh, territorial conflicts. Germany was admitted into NATO in 1955 when Germany was the stage of the biggest frozen conflict that ever was. The division of Germany and the occupation of the then uh, GDR. That was the, the mother of frozen conflict, so to speak. But uh, Germany was admitted in NATO in 1955, and not Abene. In 1955, Germany and the Allies, led by the United States, had the position that Germany should be reunified in the borders of 1937. That was the position in 1955, when Germany was admitted. That changed only in the uh, early and mid-1970s, when Germany accepted officially, the, uh, West Germany, accepted officially the eastern borders. So there is a huge precedent of admi for admitting Ukraine and Georgia at the present time, politically, legally, and from the point of view of military preparedness. But many NATO members are not ready politically for that step. Thanks for drawing an interesting example from history. Um, up to you, uh, Nadia, you heard the question now from Jan. Um, why might Donald Trump have said that NATO was obsolete? What's your opinion? I do have to admit that many times I do not know why uh, Mr. President says certain things. Uh, but um, it was in the time before there was this push for the 2% GDP to kind of activate. And I would like to believe that it was kind of a wake up call uh, reason that he wanted to uh, energize the European member states of NATO to, to contribute um, uh, their fair share uh, to, to the budget. Uh, but I do think that we also have to be always careful when we take out the statements uh, such as this one out of the context and uh, the, the conversation that was evolving around that time. So I, um, I would not like to comment on a, like a specific phrase of that comment, but we have heard many times since 
uh, the commitment of the United States administration to NATO uh, and the reconfirmation of their, um, of their full commitment. All right, so we shouldn't only listen to the president, uh, you're probably right. Um, I would now like to end this round by asking all of our panelists just to complete the sentence. NATO in 20 years' time will be, with one word, you just had to go first, Nadia, so now you can go last. Um, Tina T, NATO in 20 years' time will be? Huh, larger and stronger. <laughs> that was two words, but it's okay. <laughs> larger and stronger. Vladimir. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, defi definitely there will be a NATO to, to, uh, 20 years from now. Definitely. All right. Nadia? More resilient. More resilient. Okay, that's what you will work on, I guess. Um, I would like to thank you, the three of you, for this debate. Please give a, a warm applause to our speakers. I've enjoyed this uh, debate with you. Um, thank you for taking the time, staying with us for so long, and for your questions. This is not only the end of our panel, this is also the end of this conference, and uh, we hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, this was the fourth edition. There will most probably be a fifth edition, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, so please leave your feedback if you like. Um, if you walk out, you'll find to your right or to your left feedback sheets where you can indicate what you liked about this conference and what you would have preferred to be different. And of course, you will also be welcome to indicate what topics might be interesting for the next edition of the Multiple Challenges Conference. Um, be creative and we're very much looking forward to your feedback and most importantly, be brutally honest as always. Um, before we leave, I'd, uh, I was asked to, uh, to pay a special thanks to uh, Kristina Majecikova, who has invested a lot of time on this conference. Thank you so much, Kristina, for all the work you put in. This is your applause. And uh, now have a great evening in Prague. Enjoy yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs>